Well, hi, YouTubers. Okay, this part of the Fiddler's Fab 100 books, and I totally broke the rules here because I have to read from my own book stack, but this time I didn't. Now, what inspired this was um, two weeks ago, the TV show, the ITV show Victoria, written by Daisy Goodwin, starring Jenna Coleman as the titular queen, focused on the Irish famine of 1845 to 1852. Now, I'm going to be truly, truly honest. In the United Kingdom, in the UK, in England, we weren't taught this at school. We were not taught this. It was vague, okay? Now, I'm looking back to my own school years, and it was mentioned during the Victorian period there was a famine in Ireland, lots of people died, but never went into detail, never went into the history or the politics or anything like that. I remember more about the Treaty of Versailles than I do about that. Now, my teacher encouraged us all to go to the library, get some books, and read more about it, and I never did. Now, I didn't realise until now the suffering and degradation and the absolute misery that famine caused, it was, <laughs> it was despicable. So since then, the moment I saw that episode, I thought I've got to get more educated about this. Okay, so I went to the library and got this out. This is by um, James S. Donnelly Jr. The Great Irish Potato Famine. Now this is part book review, part going into the history. Now, and I decided I didn't want a narrative because I was looking at it and there's, there's so many books that have it as a narrative structure. I wanted cold, hard facts. Now, as a book, if you can get through the introduction, which is 40 pages, it's quite intense. You deserve a medal, honestly. Once I got past that, it was, yeah. But this is part book of you, part um, education, okay? Um, and what I learned from this, and oh my God, the suffering the suffering it caused. Okay, now secondly, I'm coming from this from a unique place of understanding, okay, because this book does not really focus on the Catholic Protestant divide, okay. Now, um, I, I appreciated that, I totally appreciate that, because I don't really, because I'm going to give you a bit of my own family history here. Um, my family came to this country in the 1890s, and um, you're fortunate on Twitter, yes, that's my surname, and so we came to this country as well, when we came to this country, we came from Brazil, which is the largest Catholic population in the entire world. We don't know why we came here, okay? We don't know why. Because our family history doesn't really, we don't really have one, okay? My great-great-grandmother had a child, um, then he got married, and after that my family went from Catholic to Protestant. I grew up, yeah, I was baptised Protestant. I now consider myself, um, I've been described as an atheist agnostic. Growing up, I went to a Church of England school, however, um, there's a large Catholic population in my area too. Um, I went to a Church of England school, a high Church of England school, a high Protestant, which as Protestant high churches have kind of like Catholic tendencies too, a bit of a mixture if you will. And I, I was in the school choir and so our concerts were done at the Catholic school down the road, the Catholic church there, and there's a nunnery walking distance from my house. Uh, my family's huge, especially on my mother's side, so a lot of intermixing, and um, so I've got, you know, they marry Catholics, it's no, not really a big deal to us. So even though I am baptised Protestant of Catholic heritage, I don't have, what I'm going to talk about, an historical memory, which is important, okay? 1890s after all, so obviously my family bypassed this. Um, it mentions quite a bit um, about how... Uh, a large population of descendants of the Irish famine went to Liverpool, which to book passage to um, uh, the New World, to America and Canada and Australia, but they stayed there and got the degradation and pain they suffered in Liverpool, which is why I did some research. Half the population of Ireland, um, so half the population of Liverpool are of now Irish heritage, which is where my dad was born because he is my grandmother, my um my father's mother was at Liverpool, that's where my dad was born. So I spent a lot of time of my um, life up, up the Bottom Mersey. And if anyone cares, I'll support Everton. So this book is really, really good if you want the good, hard, honest, brutal facts about the potato famine. The potato famine happened due to a, basically a bad batch coming over from, oh, funny enough, the New World from Mexico. Um, there was small famines as well in these particular countries that passed through, in um, Mexico, in America, but nothing to the scale that happened in Ireland. Now, it is really, really brutal. Now, I'm going to read the introduction, the difficult to read introduction, okay? Here we go. 
Contemporaries considered those who were exclusively or heavily dependent on a potato for their food to be poor, and historians today would strongly agree. These people struggled to keep their heads barely above water and would plunge below it wherever bad crop or bad weather, disease or their own personal misfortune struck without warning. Nowhere else in Europe did so high a proportion of the population come to rely on a potato for its food. Because obviously 1890s, now so 1890s, 1850s, okay? Um, 40s. Now, the potato is not, okay, not the, the most exciting of meals, but it's, it's heavy, it's starchy, it's full of calories, and it was a staple of the population because obviously it's easily exported and it's normally easily grown. I mean, if you've got qualified farmers and land, and then the famine happened. And it, this is a story about total degradation, about workhouses and the poor and okay let me read a little bit further on okay now at the time okay um anti-irish sentiment was running very very high courtesy of a gentleman by the name of charles Tavalin. charles Tavalin was basically like the treasury okay of the um victorian period and he what that was covered during the um episode of victoria that actually inspired this okay so this is what he said Okay, about the Irish population during the time. <sighs> right, and also what the Times of London said. Trevelyan was identified not only with providentialism and les affaires, but also with what had come to be called moralism. The set of ideas in which the Irish problems were seen to arise mainly from moral defects in the Irish character. Okay, further on, the Times of London said, The Times of London was to declare early as 1847 that Britain faced an island, a nation of beggars, and that among their learning defects were idolence, improvidence, disorder, and consequent destitution. Trevelyan and other moralists who were legion believed passionately that slavish dependence on others was a striking feature of the Irish national character and that British policy during the famine must aim to aim at educating the Irish people in sturdy self-reliance. So essentially what is happening is Ireland's fault. Okay now when this happened I'm gonna quickly go to Twitter because I'm gonna be posting on Twitter. I put blast that on Twitter because they Daisy Goodwin actually used Trevelyan's words of in the thing and it was I actually put so the Irish are Irish, they deserve to die, and essentially that is what Trevelyan thought. Trevelyan thought that this this was happening because of the Irish so-called weak character. They had it coming, it was an overpopulation. And um and this is this is how my education about this started. Everyone who is of Irish heritage was actually pretty cool about you didn't know, and um gave me a bit of a history lesson and for once on Twitter I wasn't judged, just respecting that, okay? So yeah, but I thought I owed it to myself to actually get more educated. So, scene set. Essentially, the Irish are having a situation and the British don't really seem to care or care enough. They seem to be basing it on the Irish character. Even though what is happening is not to do with the character, it's with the soil and the famine and the people who are, de who are dying. And it is just absolutely terrible, okay? Now, further, further along, okay, this is divided into various chapters. It talks about how there was absolutely no money coming in and while the Irish were exporting goods, okay, exporting the grain and the flour out of the country, okay, because it was trade, coming in was Indian, like, meal. Indian, Indian kind of, like, gruel, if you will, to make, like, a stew or porridge. And it was, it was just so strange, okay, how the food that you could export could save lives and the food that was imported okay probably had a good base structure but once again it, it, I guess it wasn't good enough I um, mean it really really wasn't good enough so yeah so money running out soon they started to bring in um, kind of like uh, workhouses and then soup kitchens and Daisy Goodwin's relation going back to Victoria because that's what it taught me Brought in her real life relation, I believe it was her great grandfather, say great great grandfather, a guy called Dr. Robert Trail, okay, who um, basically in his manor house, if you will, set up a soup kitchen and tried to do what he could to help the poor and destitute. And sadly, he overworked himself and his life ended prematurely, but he did what he could. There were people who were doing what they could to help 
the help the help to do something but it wasn't enough and that's where it goes to a really dark place okay i'm going further along in the book and uh okay because when it comes to things like the soup kitchens a lot of um of companies basically you have the workhouses and then you have the soup kitchens or they had a kind of like outdoor works if you will where the poor people who couldn't work the land because the land was suffering did things like build roads or kind of yeah to kind of get them out in the open again basically pay them low wages again but in terms of food but the thing is but they're not being trained in this what they built really wasn't good enough so it was kind of like a rock and a hard place sadly i mean you've got these young people doing back breaking what like breaking rocks and stuff that they're not trained to do because they're normally they're farmers or laborers and the stuff that they built wasn't up to scratch okay and then you've got this okay yeah so covering the soup kitchens and then also with the soup kitchens there was this argument between um should the food be cooked or not cooked yeah yeah that was a debate should we give the poor raw food so they can take it home and cook or should we cook it for them because you know these are the kind of things people debate in matters of life or death okay yeah so soup kitchen i'll just covered that however further along it gets really 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 bad okay right now there's something coming in shortly afterwards okay now i mentioned liverpool because obviously it's my father's birthplace okay now the thing is at in the beginning the British, the English, okay, across the channel, they were very, very sympathetic to the cause. They were doing exactly what they could to do. I mean, there were individuals raising money for awareness, for food. It wasn't just, we're going to leave them, but sadly, as this wasn't sorted out that early, okay, it led to resentment, okay? Now, I'm, gonna, I'm going to get to this chapter here called soup kitchens and amending the poor and it talks about how the irish when they were immigrating came to liverpool and then liverpool had a knock-on effect which kind of led to now half the population have it of liverpool having irish heritage okay so here we are it's just a bit in the British press and in Parliament, a strong connection was drawn between Irish evictions and the swelling tide of Irish immigrants into Britain, most of them very poor and many of them diseased. Liverpool took the brunt of this so-called Irish invasion, with as many as 50,000 pouring into the port city during the month of March alone, and with many of the new arrivals dying in the streets or crowding into its hospitals or workhouses. In driving their poor tenants across the Irish East of Britain, Irish landlords are widely held to be capitalising on the knowledge that in extremities these destitute people will be supported there under the English poor law. <laughs> so you don't have a choice, okay? You either stay in Ireland or die or cross the channel and, and die. There is there is no choice here. There is absolutely no choice. And then and then the thing is though, is there is a hope spot though. But it seemed this is going from the book, okay? There is this kind of soup kitchens and there's a possibility of making it better and then and then it gets worse trust me it's at the calm before the storm i'm gonna get to the gregory clause at the time okay prior to this was that everything was kind of being done by by the english they were they were kind of taking control of it and then they did the gregory clause and this is where bad to worse okay okay the last major test of destitution, the Gregory Clause, barring from public relief anyone holding more than a quarter acre of land, was by far the worst in its consequences. Before its draconian provision was inserted into the Irish Poor Law in June 1847, the Central Relief Authorities have regularly used local boards of guardians to extend assistance to smallholders and their families on the sensible grounds that their refusal to do so would only increase the likelihood that their constitution would become a permanent condition. Okay, so essentially, people who held more than two acres of land, so a quarter acre of land, which isn't that big, couldn't get public assistance. So, they were, if they couldn't make it work, they were pretty much doomed to die, and it will get worse for them. Yeah. And then, obviously, okay, with the power now in the hands of their landlords, instead of the British, 
so that's my foot they had all the power they could do whatever they want okay and then it really really got worse okay and this is when the kind of mass eviction I'm gonna call it an eviction a mass eviction and immigration of Ireland happened okay pushing millions out of the country now the landlords actually they didn't you know they're kind of having to support them or get rid of them so what they did was say to them I will pay your passage to America I will pay your passage out of Ireland to the new world or wherever you want to go the only difference between a maintaining someone in Ireland on the land and maintaining or booking their passage was about three shillings yeah exactly life or death measured in three shillings so families ripped apart over over a couple of pence, basically. I mean, imagine going back then if you're Irish, okay? You have probably no choice in this. This isn't a mass, this isn't a leaving for the sake of it. This is leaving to stay alive, but this is going over to a new world, which has been covered quite a bit in media, okay? I'll probably not accept you. You have to live in slums in New York or Brooklyn, or, you know, go to Canada or Australia. You don't know how you're going to be accepted. You're not leaving your land. You are being forced on your land to survival. But at the same time, you are not. You have to leave your heritage, your families, your communities. This is a division in Ireland that has never ever recovered from it because you can't recover from something like that. You did just lose people. The engine of millions left, and it says I looked up on Wiki. Okay, it said a million died. I'm putting it more than that. Okay, because if you factor in the people who died, the people who you knew about, essentially when people died, the poorest died, their coffins, okay, they put them in coffins, but have spring-loaded bottoms, so they carried them over to basically a glorified famine pit, hit the mechanism, they dropped out, then they buried another one. Yeah, exactly, they were even denied decent burial. If you factor in the young, the elderly, the people who died on the boat over to the New World, the people who died in the slums in Liverpool or elsewhere, no, that's more than a million. That's at least two, maybe under two slightly. And then obviously, okay, it wasn't just famine that they were going to die from. It was smallpox, it was tuberculosis, it was, it was other diseases. It, this was basically hell, absolute hell on earth. And the thing is, this book I like, it doesn't hold back with the hypocrisy as well going on in in Ireland at the time okay now uh, there's this bit here towards the end landlords and tenants all right now a few of the landowners okay who didn't get rid of their their the people on the land okay they let them stay they suffered financially from this okay but there was you know people a lot of good people like Dr Trail tried to do their best okay for this situation then you've got something like this okay now, at this time, obviously, okay, people suffering and uh, people putting their land, which held tenants up for sale because they couldn't afford them and themselves anymore, there was a rash of people trying, obviously, okay, because it was cheap land. And then this, this bit I love, okay? Right. The superiors of the Sisters of Mercy have paid 17000 for Lord Gort's castle on Loth Cutra, tending to convert it into a novocate for her order. But this plan was dropped and the castle was soon resold at a tidy profit of 7000 to the original purchase price. Exactly. So, you know, people basically trying, people, people, Sisters of Mercy, were, prof were now profiting, like, profiting off this degradation and suffering. It just shows the hypocrisy running on both sides of this, of this situation. And going back, I'm going back one more chapter, okay, once again, this was in 18, 1847, once again the times, um, regarding the Irish people, because eventually, as it wasn't sorted, tide was now turning. In the, came to the times in March 1847, Ireland was a nation of beggars, and thus the challenge was enormous. We have to change the very nature of a people born and bred from the time immemorial in virtue, indolence, in providence, disorder, and consequ consequent destitution. Yeah. Okay, eventually, as it wasn't sorted, resentment began to build, and 
the tentative relationship, which probably has always existed, came okay, between the Irish and the English within the United Kingdom, fractured even more, which led to splintering that travelled hundreds of years down the line. I have seen, I, I have seen films set in like New York or you know or Brooklyn or people areas that have a large Irish American population, or spoken to people who are of Irish American heritage, and they it's like an historical memory, and that's what I'm going to get to. With this happening, with you being forced to leave Ireland so early, Ireland like this, imagine, okay, you know, your last memory of the Emerald Isles before you leave for the last time and you never return is of suffering, pain, degradation, famine, hunger. That is an historical memory which you took with you to the new world. So obviously, okay, when people trying to find out through their own family history, it's normally done orally. So this is described to them, historical memory. With an historical memory like this, factoring down through like the last century, you can see, you can see how with this actions of these years intensified the English-Irish clashes, if you will. Uh, so, I'm, I don't have a historical memory, but I think it's just wrong. I mean, I, my family in 1890s, obviously, but... But the fact that this happened, and the thing, this book does not touch on Queen Victoria. I'm going back to Queen Victoria by Daisy Goodwin again, okay? This book does not touch um, a lot on um, Queen Victoria, okay? Now, I can't know if it's in this book, okay? Or I'd read this online because I'm doing some research. But Queen Victoria, like, imagine Queen Victoria, like, donated £1,000. And then an Indian sultan, um, Indian, like, um... Hell or something weren't to donate like 10 and they're like you can't do that because you can't donate more than the queen because it's wrong exactly this, this book just gave me the bare facts and obviously it's like 20 or something pages and then traveling further down but it's this concept this absolute concept okay of they don't care they absolutely don't care and it's it's a difficult read i'm recommending this book there's more out there okay by James S. Donnelly, The Great Irish Potato Famine. But the thing is, I knew a lot more, courtesy of one episode of Victoria and this book than I've known in my entire life because um, I just never read anything about this. However, I want to say this to Daisy Goodwin or someone, anyone, but Julian Fellows, okay? No, nice respect to you, Julian Fellows, okay? But the thing is, you like the upper classes more than the lower classes. I learnt more in one episode of Victoria in this book. This story needs to be a TV show, okay? Just to educate the masses on what really happened. Don't go for sensual, don't sensationalise it. Bare facts, for historical documents, get get the truth out there, okay? I mean, one thing I respect after I saw the episode and read this book, that no one judged me for not knowing this, and I'm glad I know that I did. So I think that story of the Irish famine needs to be covered more in the media. I think that this should be the uh, did that needs to be covered more. I think this needs to be a TV show. Okay, just 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 for an education point of view, the diaspora was a disgusting thing which absolutely decimated Ireland, and this this needs to this needs to be told more. Okay, so right, we're talking now for like twenty five minutes, so. I'm calling this here. Read this book. I'm going to put links in it. I'm a lot more educated. Thanks to Twitter for not judging me after I saw um, that episode. And I'm saying goodbye here. Sign off, YouTubers. Bye now.